if I can perhaps start with the consultation that's coming through in May, uh, which you've alluded to and, and came out on the 29th of Jan in response to the Culture and Conduct Report. Do, are you able to tease out a little further what you see uh, the consultation looking like, the areas specifically that, that you think uh, that, you, that you want to look further at? Look, a lot of the concern on issues I think we've certainly heard is because we've sent a pretty strong message around soft commissions, um, concern from uh, specific parts of the financial advice sector about what the future of commissions is. Um, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but we certainly do want to hear uh, specific concerns if, they are, if there are some uh, in the uh, sector uh, about how commission structures work and why that is important for your sector. Um, because obviously um, getting paid is um, crucial uh, to the sector, but we are concerned about some of the egregious behaviour that we've seen around soft commissions. I understand that that may cause some unease, but I just want to give um, uh, some assurance um, that we'll have a good look at how all the commission's um, systems work, and we're not out to wreck that system. Uh, but we are, we are wanting to have a good look at it uh, and making sure that the good customer outcomes that we want are, are, in, are ensured by, those, by the systems that will endure over that time. Yeah, you spoke in the media release and, and just, just earlier around some of the regulatory gaps around supervision and so on. How, how do you see that playing out perhaps in the, in the consultation process? Look, it's difficult because it's all new territory. Um, we've never regulated uh, uh, for conduct and culture of financial institutions. Um, but certainly both FMA and the Reserve Bank found some instances where um, the behaviour, certainly in the insurance, insurance sector, um, was below par. Um, so that's why I think um, we've made some pretty clear messages about the likes of soft commissions and the perverse incentives that we've seen uh, there by them being in place. Um, but then I think um, in and around the margins, again, uh, around uh, other commission structures, we need to make sure we have, I think, what I would call a, a mature conversation about that uh, and making sure, again, we get the balance right. Um, again, I think you know there are a lot of things happening in the sector um, at, right at the moment. We've got the ESLAB bill, we've got um, you know the review of the insurance sector, um, we've got um, you know the aftermath of the FMA and Reserve Bank process. So I, I can understand um, that there could be some anxiousness. There, there is some anxiousness there, um, but can I just also uh, allay any anxiousness by making sure that um, along the process? And I hope that you've seen that by the way that we've dealt uh, with the sector between coming into government and now, that making sure we take a, you know, a balanced approach is the way that we'll continue to consult. So just heading to the Royal Commission findings, of which I think there were 76 or so, um, how, how important was the Royal Commission process in shaping the, the, the response that we had here, both in terms of the way the conduct and culture review took place, but then also the, some of the, the drivers of change? Oh, look, I'd say influential, but not necessarily a major driver of what you will see here in New Zealand. Um, I'm thankful that the, the kind of egregious behaviour that we saw in Australia wasn't borne out in a large way here in New Zealand, uh, which, which um, I'd like to you know, obviously acknowledge the sector for. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we need to address, and the FMA and the Reserve Bank obviously pointed that out, that there are some things um, that need to be addressed now so we don't get, have the ability uh, for things to get out of hand in the future. The, they are different cultures and I can't quite put my finger on why Australia is so different uh, to New Zealand. Some of it might be the size of the market. Um, but um, I think making sure we make those changes um, and consult along the way, as, as, as we've said, I think will hopefully put um, consumers in a much better spot um, but also obviously give the certainty um, to the sector about um, which direction we're heading in. Um, there's some extreme stuff that has been floating around for a long time, which we've made some strong statements about. Um, but, but everything else, um, I guess it would be of interest to this room. Again, we are making sure that we're consulting uh, and we'll deal with in a balanced way. So just, just picking up that, that sense of what can, what can and should the industry do? You know, there's this notion when there's regulatory and legislative change that the government and the regulator does stuff and then the industry's got to respond. Um, there's a consistent message of actually the industry can start to do a lot of its stuff itself. Yep. Well, what, what does that look like for you? Well, a lot of what the FSC is already doing actually. I think one of the uh, main themes that came out of both the banking and uh, the insurance uh, inquiries by the FMA and the Reserve Bank um, is the sector itself taking greater oversight over the way it deals with customers. Um, you know, uh, I think we saw um, more scrutiny of that in the insurance uh, report. 
Um, but I think um, with both the reserve, uh, with the Royal Commission across the Tasman, um, and the reviews that happened here um, uh, uh, at the end of last year, in the middle of last year, uh, the finance sector itself and some entities within it um, saw the writing on the wall and started moving uh, proactively. Um, so I'm heartened by that. Um, but unfortunately, um, as is in life sometimes, those who are on the extreme um, can ruin it for others um, and, and, and mean that you have to have a good look at the regulations within uh, the sector. Again, uh, I think taking a balanced approach to that is uh, my overall message to this, uh, to this uh, audience um, because I think there is so much going on uh, at, this, at, at one time um, that you know being extreme in, in the way that you deal with things is not the way you want to deal um, uh, is not the way that we want to operate. Yeah, it's interesting that notion of you know as you correctly point out the, the sector on the insurance front has now signalled the end of the offshore trips based on sales volumes yeah. and so on. And the FSC introduced the code, and clearly there's a, the code of conduct coming in for advisors. So this culture and conduct and giving meaning to it. And I guess the, I guess the message from us, and, and we'll tease it out over the, over the day, is, is what, can, what can and should the sector be doing to, in a sense, own its own future, rather than just wait for um, you know, rig change that might drive certain activities or certain business models or whatever. Yeah, and I'd just, um, I'd just like to reinforce the message that I have given sometimes at the roundtables that the FSC has um, held uh, around the country. Uh, and that is that there is mutual benefit um, to consumers, the sector and the government to ensure that people are getting sound financial advice. Um, you know, there's some issues in the insurance sector at the moment that we're working through, but we want to make sure uh, that every New Zealander is insured for whatever may crop up in their lives or whatever may, Mother Nature uh, may throw our way. Um, because if we've got a massively underinsured country, um, then that has implications. Uh, uh, for the government. Also there's business opportunity for the sector but as I pointed out in the opening remarks of my speech 68% um, of New Zealanders um, do have money concerns um, and you know preparing for whether it's preparing for retirement um, saving uh, for um, you know personal use uh, or making sure you get, get good advice about a mortgage um, yeah. we can't have that level of uh, anxiety within uh, you know, within the market, uh, and a lot of people in this room are the people that will ease that anxiety. Um, I think, and I made uh, the comment within the speech as well, making sure that we look after small advice firms uh, along this um, journey as well is extremely important to us, um, because we know that, um, you know, especially in a lot of regional areas, um, a small number of, a large number of small firms are actually making sure that people in those areas get the financial advice. So that was why it was useful. Um, I think during the code process that we were able to touch base with some firms both in, I think it was Hawke's Bay and Auckland, uh, to make sure we got a gauge of where people were, were sitting. Yeah, and that's really heartening because in this room there are people who have driven several hours to be here from the regions and and, and they deliver services in, in the regions. And, and pretty key, sorry. Yeah, and uh, one of the key concerns that we've had uh, all along the way with the FSLAB journey is that um, if you make it too onerous, then I think with the profile of the industry, you may see some people exit the sector altogether. Um, and we're not out to reduce the amount of advice that is out there in the sector, but we are certainly wanting to make sure that we um, we work with the sector to lift the quality of your advice that um, that consumers are getting. And also, I, I think, make it um, a much, hopefully, simpler process for consumers as well, so they can better understand and access the advice that they really need. Yeah. That question around insurance is kind of important. <clears throat> it, it feels like, uh, you know, the, the FSC does lots of data. Uh, all our data tells us we're in a flat marketplace. Hasn't really been growing significantly other than age base increases and mm. so on. Um, do you have a sense, do you have any kind of insight, you know, wh why do most New Zealanders wander around either blissfully um, unaware or just self-insured to just take on the risk and say, I can manage the risk if something happens? Oh, look, I think, um, certainly I think uh, some anxiety about entering into the process. Uh, I know that, um, and I think I've said this before at FSC uh, uh, forums, uh, when I recently had to renew um, some life insurance, I felt like I was um, negotiating a free trade agree agreement. Um, it was difficult, um, and you know, I, I'm the Minister of Commerce, um, I'm not a Rhodes Scholar, but I think I should understand these things. Um, but you know, I found that you know, if if the process is too onerous for um, the, the the individual, then I think they'll simply just walk away. 
um, and I think um, trying to make things much more plain English um, and I know that it's difficult, especially with some of the regulation that government can put upon uh, the sector, um, is the way that we want to head so then um, people are making the wise, motivated, informed decisions that they, we hope that they are making. And hopefully by making some of the disclosure statements um, much more plain English and upfront and along the way, that um, co consumers will feel a lot more comfortable about the process. Yeah. Can we just turn quickly to KiwiSaver because the default review has kicked off yeah. uh, and there was obviously the, the KiwiSaver bill that turned up at the end of 2017-18. Yeah. Um, uh, it feels like KiwiSaver is in many ways the bridge into a financial conversation with all New Zealand just because, of the, just because most Kiwis have got KiwiSaver. Yeah. Um, what, what's your sense or what, what's your vision, if you like, long term for what KiwiSaver can do in terms of helping the, the literacy issue and the planning issue and the advice issue? Yeah, look, I think um, trying to engage, um, well, there are two issues. We want to get, obviously, there's, there, are, there is a tale of New Zealanders who are just um, not engaged with KiwiSaver at all. There's also a lo rather large number of people who are enrolled in KiwiSaver who aren't contributing anymore. And hopefully some of the stuff that's going through a bill at the moment in the House uh, will deal with that. But I, I think... Um, and this will come out through the default uh, review, um, looking at options that might force some more kind of granular conversations b between consumers and their KiwiSaver provider about their long-term KiwiSaver balances, I think is useful. Um, you know, there's a debate about the moment about, you know, do we have a default uh, setting where if you are young and you come into KiwiSaver, then you go automatically go onto a, a, you know, a, a riskier setting. Um, because there's obviously you've got, you've got a lot more uh, runway. And those are the kinds of conversations I think we need to have because it's, it's certainly, from our experience, set and forget, um, or it's you get into it and you're into it if you're young uh, for the purpose of um, a first-home deposit, which is a great um, you know, feature of the system. Um, but also there's a reminder that KiwiSafe is, you know, is still fundamentally a retirement savings scheme. So I think that's just one of the things that will come, uh, discussions that I think will come up uh, during the um, review that I hope will get more Kiwis engaged in actually uh, in managing their KiwiSaver because at the moment it's just sit and forget. Yeah. Um, last couple of questions. You've obviously got a very wide portfolio. You've been kept very busy with lots of different things. How do you, how do you manage all of these competing priorities as they turn up, whether they fires or civic defence activities, along with your other, other portfolio responsibilities? Great staff and a great partner. Um, <laughs> um, look, look it, it is difficult to manage, but um, I'm not joking. Um, it, truly having a wonderful team behind me makes sure that you can manage the competing needs, and sometimes we can't control what's happening uh, in a natural sense. Um, but, and I think I've again have said this at FSC, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful honour and privilege to be able to do some of these things. Um, again, the, the message is we want to make sure we get the balance right here, um, but it's, you know, um, I didn't come here to eat my lunch. I think you know if there are challenges that are there to, to do uh, and get through, then you just kind of systematically work through it and make sure you hopefully get the balance right. Fantastic, Minister. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, really appreciate your thank openness you. and your candid conversation. Hopefully, folks, you get a sense that there's a minister who's committed. He wants the outcome. He wants us on that journey. And and I think I think we should take great heart from your presence today and your comments today. So please join me in thanking the minister. Thank you.